anything that's that matters and is worth doing requires ownership and it really is a story of ownership what do you decide to take on what do you decide to own and how are you going to nurture it are you taking ownership of your journey of your story of what's taking place or are you trying to deny the journey that you've been on the story that you possess the gift that you're meant to share with others. It's an amazing thing when you start to take ownership of what you have, the journey that you've been on. And once you start taking ownership, things start showing up differently. Things start allowing you to be your true authentic self. But how many of you are tapping into that gift that you're meant to give somebody else? So within this episode, we have a great, phenomenal guest on with us, Carla Parsons. And just to see the impact of what he is creating within his community, what he's extracting to create as the legacy that he wants to live by, and what he wants to leave when he's gone by the people that he impacts. The only way that he's able to do that, though, is by taking ownership of what's occurred in his life taking ownership of the story that's meant to be shared with somebody else. So within this episode, we talk about the power of relationships and community, the energy given by the environment. If you show up in your your true authentic self and being vulnerable and finding and focusing on what matters most to really dive into that, to expand that, to make sure that you show up and are able to pour into others by tapping into what matters most to you. So after the episode, take the time and see, are you embracing that journey that you've been on? Are you embracing your story that's meant to be shared and given to somebody else as a gift? Or are you trying to run away from it and missing out on an opportunity to impact the lives of somebody else? Enjoy the episode and we'll catch you later. What is up, our fellow Legacy Ninjas, for another journey on extracting the legacy for each of us. As we talk, each of us has a story. Each of us has something inside of us that needs to be extracted, to be put out, to share with the world and society to make that impact that you want to see. So today, we have the honor of having another wonderful coach Another wonderful individual that's just got a heart and passion for others and really wants to do some big things with changing the way we interact, how our society is viewed and what happens in our society. So today we have the pleasure of having Carlo Parsons on with us. And like I said, I've met uh, Carlo through a coaching group, but just his heart and passion really speaks and really aligns with what we're doing within the legacy digging community with our legacy ninjas. So, Carlo, if you want to just introduce yourself just quickly, um, and then we'll get into it. Yeah, thanks for having me on this podcast, Scott and Patrick. Yes, my name is Carlo. I like to joke that I'm a coach coach because I coach a lot of coaches. Uh, What I really do is I help people be able to promote themselves in a way that is aligned to why they started the journey in the first place. And that's really important to me and where we met in Coaches Promoting Coaches, uh, which is a group I founded, is uh, is that I, I created that group specifically because I found that there wasn't enough of an opportunity for people like coaches specifically to support support each other while at the same time develop their own following. So, yeah, that's kind of where I'm at in my journey right now. That's awesome, man. Uh, we're thankful to be a part of your group and it aligns so much with our vision in terms of collaboration and being able to to lift each other up um, because there's definitely plenty of opportunity for um, others to thrive and thrive together and work as a tribe so thank you so much for for putting that together because it is definitely much needed Amen. I think we're also scared and wary of, of each other when we approach each other online, because <laughs> there's always this start of like, am I being sold to, mm-hmm. uh, you know, and, and I've, I've definitely had my share of, 
of those reactions. And I think we, we could really use an opportunity to leverage our ability to refer each other and, and speak wonderful things about each other. Well, and I think it's interesting because when we had talked, this whole thing is about digging that legacy, really extracting what that legacy is for you as an individual. And our inspiration for this is really to have people start doing the deep dive, start looking and asking the questions. And I know when we had spoken about having you come on to the podcast and you uh, express this legacy piece. And it's a unique piece because I think a lot of people were focusing on us as individuals, but then when you brought up what legacy means to you, it goes such a wider range. And I know Patrick, when we were talking, it's one of those things of being part of the community and whatnot, how that changes uh, the perspective and the trajectory for you as an individual. So when you look at what you're creating and the legacy that you want to leave, what is that for you for that big legacy picture that you're going after and you're running after at this time? Yeah, it's a, the, the thing about legacy is it's only effective and meaningful if a community is involved because it, it, there's an aspect of legacy that needs to be seen and heard and, and celebrated or even be infamous, right? Not everybody has a positive legacy, but all in all, the public is kind of involved in it. Otherwise, it's just a well-known secret. <laughs> and for me, engaging the community is, is the legacy. Uh, my personal purpose has, um, over the years, I've discovered that what I really get out of bed for is helping people get sh- stuff out of their way, right? I, I help people manage their obstacles so they can do their best work. And that shows up in this, the, the, the community legacy that, that I want to build. I care about building efforts and, and legacies for myself and for people uh, that, that are useful. I want a legacy that people can use and do something with rather than just admire or hate from afar. And that requires engagement that it, uh, that requires a lot of time on my end and effort on my end to nurture. But the good thing is it comes naturally for me. I really like that. Um, again, you know, that aligns with our vision to be able to collaborate together and things like that, you know, and what's really, uh, it's an interesting take Carla, right? Because a lot of people, when they view legacy, it always kind of defaults into the I, right. And, and then they start talking about like, well, I want my legacy to be right. And whatever it is, their children, their family, you know, maybe they want that big giant statue of them, you know, so people remember them, et cetera. But I love that yours is pretty much, it says that, you know, that your work will, will showcase through others. Right. And so it's kind of that, uh, that servitude, you know, attitude that really, again, like you said, within a community will continue to spread. So I really love that. And I really appreciate that. Thank you. When, when you two first mentioned that you, you have these conversations about legacy via podcast, like, I think the first reaction I was like, I am so (laughs) anti-legacy. And, and part of that is because, and I'm actually not, I'm real. I thought about this since we had the conversation. I'm actually not. I come from a family that believes it has a legacy. And to me, I was like, that's not a legacy. That's an obligation. It's like, (laughs) if you have to impose your legacy on somebody like your children, that becomes an obligation. That becomes a weight they have to bear. Mm. That, that to me is not a legacy. A legacy is something that you, that you inspire people to own, that you inspire people to take on because they believe so much in the mission. Hmm. And again, you need, you need the public. You need, you need the people around you. It's not, it's not a solo effort, right? Uh, because then if, if, if you're just passing it on, it's authoritarian. It's just like <laughs> pushing people to do something they probably don't even want to do. And that that's not a legacy. And um, I'm really glad that you invited me to this because I've had such a hang up around that word for the longest time. And now I'm realizing like, yeah, actually I do. I do care about having a legacy. It's just not the way that I was educated about, about it uh, from where I come from, where I had to represent a specific type of man, a specific type of identity, a specific type of job, uh, and reputation, which all of that, I, I literally threw under the drain. I was like, well, 
I'm not going to be in a medical field. Uh, I am not going to work for a corporation. I'm not going to marry a woman. Uh, <laughs> I don't even like girls that way. Uh, that kind of thing. Like it, it's a lot of those things. Um, I'm no longer going to be super religiously devout where I'm starting to recruit people in, into my religion kind of deal. Not that my family was like that, but we were very, very, my family still is pretty much very, very Catholic. But yeah, I have all these things that were expected legacies for me to carry on that I was like, no, th- those are obligations. Yeah, and you bring a very solid point too. Oh, go ahead, Scott. Well, like that, I think that's a solid point like Patrick was sitting on there. And I think it's a unique approach right there because of the fact Patrick and I have talked that there's times where we have verbiage and we have things that are passed down that we may need to look at differently, maybe reword it, bring it into a different light. And I think that's a powerful thing with having the anti-legacy view and adjusting that. Um, and I think that's a huge part that if the uh, legacy ninjas are listening to this, take the time and really sit down and say, okay, I despise or I don't like how this is put verbiage wise and how we put the stress on and the strain on us. Find a different route, find a different way that you can present that and have it light you up and have it be that passion to drive you towards whatever you're going to call the legacy. Um, Because I think we've had individuals on Craig and Asante where Craig did highlight that piece where you talked about what if it isn't a good legacy, but it's a bad legacy. And so it's how do we go against that grain? How do we change it? And I think that's the perfect thing right there that you've hit on that it allows people to say, okay, let me express and look and see how can I do this differently and go against the status quo and carve my own path out of how I perceive things and how I see stuff. And so when you look at that by taking that stance, what do you see that in regards to the legacy that you're developing or whatever you want to call it, uh, taking that stance in a different light than a lot of people will take and just accept instead of questioning and looking and seeing what really sticks for them and fits for them? Yeah, it, well, nobody ever likes to have things thrown at them. So even when somebody says, you're going to carry on your family's legacy, the word carry to me is like, I know it's all semantics, but for some people, they act, they take this to heart. They carry it. And some of us are okay carrying stuff throughout our lives. Some of us are a little bit more particular and questioning. I think the, for me, having the distinction between what I'm carrying, what I'm choosing to carry, and what I'm taking to own, right? So I take ownership of this legacy. I want to create a, a mindset or a culture where people want to own it and take it on without me having to ask or without, especially without me being able to, or needing to pressure anyone to, to carry it. Right. I don't want it to be a weight for people. I actually want it to lift people up. And I think that's where real legacies actually soar because it needs to be effortless. People need to be running towards it rather than us like trying to throw it at them because nobody ever likes that. Much, le- much like nobody ever likes to be sold to, nobody ever likes to just be thrown, uh, to, to just be thrown things at. Yeah, I think there's uh, something about having that chip on your shoulder, right? That um, it's kind of like, I don't know if we're born with the innate ability to really have that grit to push through or go through some of the toughest things. It's just one of those things that you just experience and you develop it and you grow it, right? To hear the path that you've chosen, kind of almost like the complete opposite, right? Running the other way. I know that that decision didn't come lightly. I know, you know, um, being f- coming from an Asian family with the whole honor and, you know, all of those things, there's a lot of different things, uh, almost that a- additional pressure, right? Because now you're maybe dishonoring the family, quote unquote, and things like that. So kudos to you for being able to get to this point, because again, I can't imagine that getting to that part was easy. Uh, are you able to tap into some of that as, uh, you know, as part of the oh, story? Oh, yeah. Oh, do I have a story for you? Okay, so <laughs> picture this. My father was one of 13 children. Oh. My grandfather was also one of 13 children. Wow. Out of 
all of those births <laughs> into adulthood, somehow it is down to me and just one male cousin to carry wow. on the last name. My last name, I was my my last name at birth is not my last name at marriage. I changed my last name at marriage for other reasons, um, for for safety because we're an LGBT family and I I won't like a story for another time, sure. but my last name was, uh, was Eog up until, uh, the last five years. And so there was a lot of pressure on me to, I mean, imagine coming out and people saying that's okay for as long as you give us a grandkid. And in my mind, I'm like, okay, that's messed up because I might give you a grandkid, but I don't know if it's going to be blood because mm. I don't have a uterus. <laughs> Uh, and I'm likely not going to marry someone with a uterus. So this is going to be interesting. So for a while, I had all these hangups about like, do I, you know, do my partner and I adopt, have a kid? How is, how is my, my father's family going to react to this? I'm, I'm going to marry a man. Um, I actually didn't change my last name at marriage. I changed my last name at adoption when we adopted our daughter. Mm-hmm. So there were all these junctures just in that one journey of choosing to be an alternative family and marrying a man and deciding to adopt that ties back into the pressure I had from my family to just freaking carry on the last name because <laughs> my older cousin has a daughter they're no uh, he and his wife have decided they're not going to have kids anymore mm. so I was the younger cousin by like 20 years not 20 sorry about 15 years and I was like uh dear too bad I have bad news for you <laughs> uh the buck stops here that last name end, ends with me that's a huge thing to carry. Yes. And I say carry because I wasn't re- willing to take ownership of it. It's not the journey I want to have, right? Like me being able to claim my daughter because we have the same last name is way more important because I've seen it in the gay community, particularly because I'm brown and my daughter is mixed. That if she has a, an American, a white sounding last name, like an Anglo sounding last name, and I have a tribal Filipino last name, there's going to be issues in the emergency room, right? So all these things came into play and I decided to take ownership of that instead because she is, for a lack of better term, my my legacy, Mm. a legacy that she doesn't have to carry on, but she is why I, I, part of why I wake up every day alongside with my purpose. So yeah. Man, I love that story. And I want to, Scott, to get to this next question, but I want to share with you the importance and kind of the significance for a lot of people who may be listening. So my father-in-law grew up and his father was basically kind of a guy who was in the military, but just kind of passing through South Korea. And he was uh, in the French military. So he didn't have a last name growing up. And he was basically had to live pretty much in the barn. So he would drop out of school so he could work. And basically it was the neighbor who took him on and then said, you can have my last name. And so uh, for us, when we were kind of making a decision and all that stuff, my wife for a long time didn't know if she should hyphenate her last name because it was a big deal for him to even have that. You know, and so again, I know coming from your perspective too, to be able to turn around and say, hey, we've had this name in our family, but it ends here. Man, that's really incredible. How did that conversation go? I mean, are things okay now? It was a matter of telling, not asking. It was to say, this is happening. Uh, and that was like shortly right after answering the question, is the, is the baby going to be baptized? <laughs> I'm married to somebody who's Jewish. I'm not, I'm agnostic. And so it was really hard to say like, well, first of all, uh, it's going to be hard for us to find a church who will do that because gay couple. But second, I, I'm not, I'm no longer, I no longer identify as Catholic, but like, I, I'm just somebody who decides that religion is not going to be part of my identity. And I don't, that is not a legacy I want to pass on to my kid, right? She gets to decide what she wants to be because she has a, Two dads, one of them is Jewish and one of them is agnostic. She gets to decide. So I have that conversation with my husband's side of the family and not so much more on my side of the family because I I pretty much shut it down when I was like, I'm I'm just not, that is not an option I'm willing to discuss or explore. Buck stops here. It's not even take it or leave it. It's like, it is what it is. Like, it is what it is. 
And uh, with that piece going on that journey and really planting the flag and saying, okay, this is stopping now and we're pivoting and we're creating something different and it's going to be a change for generations to come. When you look at that piece for you, Carlo, on this journey that you're on and what you're trying to accomplish with the legacy within the community, how do you see what you've gone through and that flag that you planted intertwining with the legacy that you're working to build upon within your community and what you want to create for others? For me, it, it boils down to one thing. Anything that's, that matters and is worth doing requires ownership. And it really is a story of ownership. What do you decide to take on? What do you decide to own? And how are you going to nurture it? Because it may not be this community I'm building. This may not be something anyone wants to ever carry on. This might just, there's a possibility you must just, might just die out in a year. <laughs> Completely fine. But that's just part of the legacy journey, right? That, that is one, one opportunity for me to carry on, uh, not carry on, but to inspire the legacy. See, even I say carry, uh, <laughs> to inspire the legacy. Uh, but there will be other ways in the future. So it's also looking at it as like, just because you have one thing that you really care about doesn't mean that there's only one way to make it happen, right? If you own it, it will stay with you no matter what you're doing. I may find, I am convinced that it'll evolve into something meaningful enough for others to take ownership of. And once they take ownership, they create their own version of that legacy. It's not meant to keep like this one face, like everything evolves over time. And so, and it for evolution to happen, ownership needs to happen too. So it really is the ownership aspect for me. I really love that because oftentimes when we talk to people, I kind of tell them that, you know, your business, your legacy, it's not always just going to be a constant rise, right? Nor do we want that. I mean, if you look at like your heart levels on an EKG monitor, it shoots and then it flatlines for just a little bit before you get the pump again, and then it shoots up again. But you need those small periods of stagnant and of steadiness before you can rise again, or you have to kind of uh, hit that bottom level to appreciate some of that stuff, you know, so learning from your mistakes and all that stuff. So I love that you're kind of talking about that, you know, this may or may not evolve. I mean, but it's just part of the process, right? And I think that's a piece that oftentimes, especially coaches forget because they just assume sometimes that, hey, I've got my certifications, I've got my niche, I've got my training programs in place, and it's just going to be that much easier to get people in. The problem is, is that then we find out that how many of us are either stuck or how many of us get to that point where we're hearing no, because maybe we don't have the right copy. We don't, we're not identifying maybe the right, or maybe we're giving away too much up front. And then people are like, well, I got the information that I needed. Right. And then there's, you know, so there's so many different elements from a coach, you know, uh, since you've been doing this for such a long time, what is some advice that you can give for maybe those coaches who are kind of like I said, maybe forgetting to take that step back or maybe not realizing, you know, how many other things that they could be focusing on to kind of deal with some of that gap. I would give homework to those folks instead of advice, because I find that nobody takes free advice unless it's a life or death situation. And in mm. these situations, a lot of the time they're not life or death. So my homework would be literally sit down and write the first 10 things that really matter to you without editing yourself. Mm -hmm. And then look at that list and find out what have I invested in, in these 10 things? Oh man, I love that. Literally. And what have I invested in the last just 24 hours to seven days to month to year? Because it'll tell you a lot. I don't need to tell you to slow down. You probably need to find out how whether or not you actually need to and how and for what reason. Because if people don't have a reason to slow down and take account, they don't know why. They don't appreciate why. But mm. once you start taking account of the things that you care about that you haven't invested in, there you go. I laugh because it's just the, the call that we were on earlier before getting on here to record. It's just funny how things will pop up, things will show up and be highlighted. 
So it's like having the conversation with Michelle, it's there's things that are popping up, things that are spoken right now that there's somebody listening to that is struggling with whatever that is. And so like Carlo, you highlighted, it's like, do the homework, don't take the advice, but do the homework, listen and see what that needs to be extracted to fulfill whatever it is for you. Um, Because it is one of those things that what may work for one person may not work for another person, but you've got to find out and see what that is for you to be able to get to whatever level you're trying to get to and to really fine tune what's going to fit you to get to extracting that legacy or building the community, building the business, whatever it is. And so it's unique because you'll see a lot of people when you're working with them, they're like, well, this person said it this way. So let me go this route. And it's like, this is not in stone. This is for you to listen and extract whatever that is. And so when you are looking at individuals that you work with, that you talk to, how often do you come across individuals that get so hamstrung on this is what it's been said and they don't deviate from whatever's been spoken to fit what it is for them as an individual? There's usually something underlying that creates that type of intensity for people. And there is different, I've seen different ways of approaching it that have been effective. I'm sort of in the middle my approach is in between tough love and just recognition is to say like, okay, clearly you can't pause by yourself, but you need to pause. Mm-hmm. Right. And really understanding like, okay, why, why are these things, these th- things still happening? I don't know if you've heard of the five whys, like you five why the poop out of that, that situation to, to really try and understand why people are stuck because more likely than not, It's not the action that they're doing or the road that they're following. That's the problem. There's something underneath that that's keeping them tethered. It's usually a specific belief or more specifically enough, a fear Hmm. that they have not. They either are not even aware they have the fear or they're aware they're just not dealing with it. So they're bandaging it by sticking to this path. And to be specific about that, like, Clients that I serve who know they need to be out there, know know they need to put content out there. They know the means they're not implementing. They already know what they can do to to improve their situation. They're not doing it. Why? The underlying thing I've discovered for some people, they're afraid to be seen. They're so afraid to be seen and corrected that even though they know what to do, they, they don't know what to do. And looking at why are you afraid to be seen? And then asking why that reason exists. And you keep going until you get to, you distill it to, to the very base and working your way up. And for some people, it's a journey. For some people, it's that. It's a snap. Yeah, I've oftentimes found that depending on where people are at, you know, sometimes that spirit is just, it's kind of been building and just waiting for the right opportunity. And maybe they didn't even know that they were looking and that all of a sudden it makes sense. And then for some people, we're just so accustomed to habits and we're so accustomed to kind of being told what to do until they kind of start to find their stride but i think we all agree on that once you see them find their stride that is the most amazing feeling in the world and the most rewarding factor as a coach to be able to see that and just to kind of see it click as well man i'm super super excited that you're here with us carlo and legacy ninjas um If you haven't, or if you are a coach yourself, we definitely encourage you to check out uh, and connect with Carlo. Again, the Facebook group that uh, we're all connected in is called Coaches Promoting Coaches. Let's help each other uh, hired or get hired. But Carlo, what are some of the other ways that our Legacy Ninjas can connect with you? The easiest way is through social media um, at the moment. Uh, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn. I go by Carlo Parsons. I should be the only Carlo Parsons in the world. Please do not spell it Carol because there is a Carol Parsons (laughs) that exists, but you should be able to find me really, really easily. I'm quite quick at responding to people's uh, messages. So uh, that is the easiest way since everybody has access to, well, I shouldn't say everybody. Most everyone in my industry has access to a single, at least one social media platform. Uh, in existence. 
And so when you're looking at the legacy that's being built, what you're doing within the community, because I, I think the foundation piece really to see that in action is that Facebook group that you've created coaches promoting coaches and trying to adjust and change the industry and actually allow people to be themselves without getting slapped down like we see in a lot of other groups but when you look at that besides building the Facebook group how else are you going about living out the legacy that you're creating and that you're wanting to leave behind thank you for asking that because I get to put on my self-promotion hat uh, for a little bit. The programs that I, uh, that I teach have the same ethos, which is you have to run towards who you want to be and who you are in order to effectively not just sell what you have, but also work with the people you're meant to serve. I really, really believe that until you can take ownership of your situation and your journey, there's really no going anywhere else. Unless you have millions of dollars to waste on advertising and an entire staff to just do all the thinking and the outreach for you. But chances are, if you're starting out on your own, you don't have a lot of money. You only have you to rely on. You are really going to need to take ownership of your situation. And so in the stuff that I teach, it really focuses on what do you have? What can you leverage? And what do you need to implement now? Like, let's not try and build something that's going to take months. How can we make money or build traction for your business now? And it's the same thing with coaches promoting coaches. It's like, it's the idea of like, you keep trying to build an audience and you're only focused on your clients. Why aren't you looking at your marketplace as not just the clients or the leads, but also your competitors and your collaborators? Why aren't you leveraging that? Why aren't you owning that? I know that Scott and I are both all smiles right now because we talk about this daily (laughs) all the time so thank you so much i mean uh at one point if you just want to fill in for one of us on the podcast as a host carlo (laughs) feel free (laughs) oh man you i'm honored (laughs) yay so i'm an honorary honorary native son (laughs) yes yes for sure (laughs) no we just love the message man and uh and what you're representing and what you're putting out there for other people The next segment that we really like to get into is something that we found is really powerful for us, uh, not only in the podcast, but also our individual lives and businesses. And it's really just an opportunity to kind of maybe thank either people uh, or acknowledge, you know, something or someone or a a many combination of really just kind of that public acknowledgement and kind of what we found is that through this thankfulness piece, it allows you to kind of almost re-go back and and have an appreciation for events, but also it also gives you that time to reflect. And oftentimes, you know, when we're just going all the time, sometimes we forget to stop and reflect on there. So as you think about, you know, kind of your journey up to this point, is there anybody or uh, is there some people or some things that you would like to go ahead and acknowledge? Oh, thank you. I, I don't think I've ever been asked that on an interview, much less a podcast uh, conversation. Uh, the first one would be my, my spouse, my better half. His name is Brian. Uh, I took this leap. Uh, granted, I sketched it out and created a roadmap for us to look at, mm. uh, but it required a, a level of uh, belief in me on his end and trust in the process uh, to let me go ahead and leave a lucrative job in Silicon Valley to work for myself as a coach with a completely different audience, uh, since I'm currently not serving people in tech uh, like I did in my full-time work. So I'm really grateful for that opportunity to just start and end the day without feeling like I have to answer to something on his end. He has been extremely generous and thoughtful and supportive. And I genuinely can't do this in the best health, mental health, without that level of support on his end. I'm also really grateful for both of you. Uh, Scott, I see you so constantly 
uh, on, on the weekly calls. Uh, Patrick, I see you in there commenting and contributing in, in the group and coaches promoting coaches. And I'm really grateful for folks, for the, both of you and the, the other folks in the community who are showing up because when I pivoted to coaches promoting coaches from a, a training model for the Facebook group, I was like, are people even going to show up and seeing familiar faces deciding to help take ownership of the experience that I want to create so that they can have their own versions um, in their own journey is validation. And right now at the beginning phase of coaches promoting coaches, that is probably the one thing that really, really matters. And you, you both along with some key members in the group have brought that uh, for me. And I, I can't thank you enough for it. We just love what you're building. And I, I even told Scott on the very first day when I joined, right? I got a personalized message from you that just said, hey, thank you so much for joining the group and accepting the invite from Scott, right? And again, I do this every single day as part of my business. I tell people, find a reason to connect. And for me, the simplest thing that I can do is I get people's uh, notifications of people's birthdays every single day, right? They're on Facebook. And so many times I haven't talked to some of these people in a while. I don't see them uh, openly all the time in, in person, but it is a reason to be able to connect, right? And so, again, using that as part of my business, using that as part of my social media and to be able to be on the receiving end of it made me feel really good that one, you recognize that someone is joining the group and it was personalized, but also to realize where that invitation came from to put the two to immediately have a connection. And so again, I told Scott that first day, I was like, there's something different about Carlo in a good way. And so I'm more than happy. And, and I know that Scott feels the same exact way, which is why he always is like, I got to show up on that call. They were talking about this. I learned this. Right. And then he calls me afterward, if, you know, if I'm not able to attend or later that day. And he's like, yeah, these are the notes that I took. So we are appreciative of the value that you're bringing. Thank you. And I, I do my outreach really from honestly, like this is going to sound funny. It, it really is sheer gratitude is like, oh, my God. OK, people are responding. I'm so grateful. And rather than just keep that in my head, I'm like, oh, actually, I can tell people that I'm grateful. Like, so they know, like in full transparency, like. I don't know where this this is going. I'm I'm happy to see where this is leading, but like I I need this is where like the community part of legacy really comes into play, right? Real legacy relies on uh, the environment to to thrive. Yes. I have to laugh uh, during the gratitude piece. You talked about building the community and having that mindset of who's going to want to join, who's going to want to listen. And I always joke, I'm like, as a content creator, I usually feel like that's the last threshold that you hit before you take that leap and just go for it. Because launching my initial podcast, I had that same thing too. I saw to my mom, I was like, who's going to want to listen to this? Who's going to want to listen to what I have to share and whatnot? And it's like that badge of honor as a content creator, that's that one last threshold that you hit before you actually just go full board and just jump into it. Amen. It's, it, it's that. And, and that fear is, is real. And I think it's really important for people to hear that, that even for us uh, folks that are really comfortable being in front of an audience, we still think that we still wonder, like, is, are people going to pay, pay attention? Like, you know, you have followers, but are they gonna, are they gonna respond to this? Right. And not because I'm afraid of failure, but it's like, am I using my time correctly is really for me, and I know for a lot of people, what it boils down to here when we feel that fear is like, did I use my time correctly? Because sometimes that time means less playtime with my daughter or uh, less time for my own self-development, right? Because I'm building this for a, a, a community. It, it is bigger than me. So yeah, am I helping them in the right way, right? Uh, or am I, are they even receiving this message correctly? <laughs> are they going to hear me right? Uh, and, and that fear was also existent because I kept getting people literally just be rude back mm -hmm. when I reach out and make a connection. And I don't blame them because I have so many people reach out to me and I'm like, uh, I can totally tell you, you're about to sell me something. Yes. Yes. You know? it's like, ah. <laughs> Yeah, I think we, I, well, and again, this is why this group is such a great collaborative effort because 
it kind of eliminates a lot of that stigma and a lot of the things that we've experienced, right? Um, so again, another reason for appreciation. I always like to kind of ask this question too is, you know, what are maybe some book recommendations that you might have or a current book that you're reading or any nuggets that you want to share from any of those as well? Oh my God. Okay. So very interesting stuff. This whole self awareness journey really started for me coming out of a really bad breakup. (laughs) God, like eons ago. And a friend just casually gifted me this book called The Power of Now by Eckhart Tolle. And I know that a lot of people recommend this book, but it really uh, shifted how I think about things. And I still actually go back to it every now and then. I just have it on audiobook. And I have specific chapters that I listen to. And I always find something else that I can chew on in that book. Uh, For me, that was a powerful starter kit uh, to start uh, to to begin my journey of just self-awareness and separating my ego from the things that I actually care about doing and what I represent in the world. My purpose is not my, my, my ego, right? And my feelings aren't my ego. Oh God, I, I read a lot of this book, but, but let me give you, let me answer the second question. I just downloaded this book because I'm really interested. A friend recommended it to me, so no reviews yet, but it is called The War of Art by Stephen Pressfield. Mm-hmm. And it really is um, working through, yes. oh, I just started it. <laughs> it it's ba- basically being able to access your creativity uh, by breaking through your blocks. And it, it's a, it seems like a framework to, to get to that. And I like these things because I work with people who, all, the, when I work with somebody, it's, it's 99.9% probable that they have a block of some sort. Not everybody responds to the same framework. So I always like finding different ways of approaching a problem or a challenge. And so, yeah, that is on my list. One of the things that I, I read too, as, uh, as I was reading shortly before I started reading The Power of Now was it wasn't a self-help book for coaches necessarily. It was The Gabriel Method. And it's another book that I still have handy. It's actually more about weight loss as a lifestyle rather than as a diet. But it, it was the first introduction I had around the power of appreciation and the power of uh, being uh, creating a stress-free existence mm-hmm. and how it contributes not just to your body, but to your endeavors. And more importantly, that book taught me that my brain, my brain doesn't speak in words. Mm-hmm. My brain speaks or understands pictures. So if I want something, I have to visual, visualize it, literally look at an image rather than and tell it like, for example, if I want to lose weight, I don't tell my brain, I need to lose five pounds in two weeks, right? And that's what the coaching world is teaching right now is specificity. But when it comes to you and your psyche, it really matters that you create a picture that your brain understands, your lizard brain understands, because until your lizard brain decides to get out of the way, it's going to be very hard for your thinking brain to actually help you through uh, your quest. So those three books, I would say, are a good way into understanding this brain right now. I love that. Yeah. And I'm curious, uh, definitely want to hear your thoughts on the war of art. A lot of my background was really in poetry, creative writing. I actually started bringing that into the business world when I first started. So there would actually be meetings where I would actually leave reading poetry to people, or I would host these creative writing courses for business owners. And people started finding other ways to maybe develop breakthrough or have a way to de-stress. And, and I'm actually writing a course now so that Scott and I can uh, hopefully take to the corporate world in regards to introducing and putting frontliners and leadership on a trusted platform by utilizing some of these writing methods before maybe then doing their town halls or trying to gather honest and real feedback, you know, by building some of the trust. So um, I appreciate, you know, that. And I'm definitely excited to kind of hear your thoughts uh, to be able to check out that as well. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, I will. Uh, I will let you know. It's a, it's in queue, actually. I'm about to start it today, so I'm really excited. Awesome. 
All right, Scott Drummond. I know it's your favorite part of the show. Yeah. Every part of the show is my favorite, <laughs> but this is actually one of those unique things because, Carla, you know, interviewing people sometimes it's the same questions, and it's like, oh man, what what can we do differently? How we can how can we go about a different path? And so what we utilize, and I found this through a mentor of ours, Travis Brown, who's another fellow podcaster, and he ended up creating uh, what's called pod decks. And so it started off as physical decks, and then he ended up creating an app. So every month, there's two new decks that get released to this app. Oh, and so cool. it's just different conversation pieces. Um, and so it's funny, uh, I have table topics and I used to host the table topics episode on Clubhouse. Oh, I got yes. really busy and I couldn't uh, do it anymore. And sure. I used to have it on my Facebook profile as well as, as a live. So I'm so into this. <laughs> Perfect. I love it. So the uh, first deck that we're pulling from is the hypothetical deck. And it says, how would the world be different if Zeppelins had caught on and were the dominant form of air travel? <laughs> well, Zeppelins, uh, I, I, my understanding is that they're not as speedy. So I would say luxury travel would probably luxury air travel would probably be way more affordable just because there's so much space, either that or actually, yeah, I I would stick to that. Like I I would say like we would probably have more luxurious travel experiences and probably way more commerce up in the air. Because think about something moving slowly that's quite spacious. I forget, like, no, maybe it's not, no, the Zeppelins don't have a spacious part, do they? I'm going to have to Google that. It depends yeah. on how you build them. Um, yeah. So, so um, my understanding, you know, and for maybe some of the people who are listening wondering kind of what a Zeppelin is, you know, it's, think of like the Goodyear blimp, right? Yeah. That used to haul, uh, that used to fly over the football stadiums and things like that. So, you know, that it's going at a slower rate of travel maybe a little bit more steady, you know, so if you're trying to take pictures or camera angles, things like that, but I always kind of like picture it that if we were going to travel that slow of rate or whatever, if you want to get the full experience that they might just have things that are kind of like dangling from the bottom and you just kind of sit there and it's like a, a ride outside, you know, to get to your destination and you just kind of parachute off or get dropped off into, you know, almost kind of like a tuck and roll situation, but coming from the air. I think it's uh, it's funny because when this came up, it was the fact that it's just very slow and methodical and very peaceful, I guess, if you really look at it. Because I think in our day and age, we're so quick and we're go, 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 go. I think if this was actually the form of air travel that took over, how much more at peace we may be um, instead of a high speed aspect that we're always seeing how much more people could actually take the time and slow down and appreciate what's around them and just have that different perspective shift to look at things differently and so it's unique with these questions because like i'll get outside the box very far sometimes with (laughs) these questions and so this piece right here it's like how how much of us would be able to slow down and actually take everything in instead of go, 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 like we are in today's society. Yeah, I like that. And I think the other side for me that I'm realizing now is that because it is moving slow, that more up in the air experiences would be created outside of just the travel aspect uh, that allows people to actually see outside of their bubble. Like Mm -hmm. every time we are up somewhere high and we really see a big picture view, it changes our perspective. And I think that's a beautiful thing. Like if if zeppelins were ever you know to replace planes right it just you're right like it just kind of makes us step outside of our world maybe it's something worth looking into guys <laughs> right native son the zeppelin experience <laughs> it could be a workshop on a zeppelin there you go like a cruise oh my god yes. we would have yeah we would have up in the air cruises yes i love it change your perspective you change your life yeah <laughs> i like it <laughs> we'll, we'll create different things and whatnot. So <laughs> the uh the next one actually uh Travis created this when uh New Year's came around. So it's a little bit different here um because it's a uh, new year, new you. And so 
we are at the point right now when you think about it too is fourth quarter of this year heading into the new year um so kind of planning and putting things to perspective to get that jump start for the first quarter so the question here is what didn't go to the plan last year so i would say kind of when looking at it maybe this year what didn't go to plan that you wanted it to and then is it something that you could potentially pivot and bring into the new year as a different perspective or approach that you see that's available that you want to bring forward? I would say one of the things that I, I still think about is the fact that I had a specific business model that I wanted to launch because of the pandemic, it wasn't possible. But I was really, the reason why I think about it a lot is I was actually really grateful that it took me to this route because it got me to meet so many people in, in the coaching industry specifically uh, and understand what their needs are a little bit better to be able to serve them a little bit better. I had like one that was really geared towards uh, team travel and team experiences. It was a little bit more corporate rather than like grassroots based. Uh, and I, it was still writing on the coattails of, of my, my Silicon Valley experience, right? That I still like, would like to see come to life at some point, but right now I'm not, I'm not clinging to as much because I'm really enjoying the ride that I'm in. Scott, go ahead and give me that question one more time. Uh, what didn't go to plan this past year that you thought you wanted it to go to plan? And so I think it's just kind of saying, okay, this is what I had planned, um, but it didn't come to fruition or whatever happened. You know, I think that there's always things that we in our minds kind of envision that uh, should happen or that way we would like to see happen. And it's a beautiful thing when it does execute and it happens the way that you think it's supposed to. But I think also there's a great experience and I've talked about this before, kind of the beauty of struggle, right? The beauty of failure. And so when things don't go, oftentimes it kind of results in a better experience or a long-term is a uh, works out almost better than what you had envisioned because it deviated from the way that you thought it was. And so I kind of look at a lot of different aspects, right? I mean, launching this uh, thing, I, I never thought we would get into the coaching realm, right? I thought it was just going to be a podcast and more of the marketing side of things, right? So to be able to get into the coaching realm and now finding that like, not only do we have a passion for it, but, you know, people really are getting the things that they need out of it. Right. And so to be able to see that, and again, that was a whole deviation of th something that we didn't plan to go that way. So, you know, oftentimes just because it didn't work out the way that we thought doesn't mean that, you know, doesn't mean that it didn't end up where it was supposed to go. I think for me, it's the journey of podcasting. Uh, when I launched the divorce pod, uh, which is kind of coming to the end of running its life. I've gone enough and healed in that piece that really it's out there for people to listen to. I thought it was going to have more growth, but you know, it opened up the doors to where I, where, what I'm doing now and where we're at with the business and everything that we're bringing to fruition. So even with that, where it didn't fully get to what I envisioned, it opened up different doors to explore and bring on different things that really were sitting there. Um, it's just opening up that one door to get to the next three doors to open up and pull out whatever it is. So it's one of those things. It's just the constant progression and testing and pivot when need to and not giving up. Okay. Last one that we have is what's one thing you're never afraid to do? I'm really proud of this. I am no longer for, for, for a while now, probably two decades now, I'm no longer afraid to just be who I am. And, and I, I, let, me, let me give you some context. I was punished and bullied for being really feminine as a kid. And so in my teens, in my early 20s, I really was super guarded. Like I, I had to present as masculine. Um, and that was a lot of, it was really exhausting. And it just looked funny. I just looked awkward. <laughs> um, and when I came out and I, I found certain communities I identify, that I identified with and families like that I got to build, right? Of, of friends and people that I care about. Uh, I just developed this, not even confidence, just like this belief that I'm like, oh, I'm actually okay. Like I, I don't need to do anything else. I could just 
be the guy who has shock white or platinum hair that sometimes goes to dance class and heals completely like all good right um i i think being able to define what it means to be a man in this world to me it, it mattered more to be a good father uh to be a good partner uh and to be a good contributor um to my environment and it's really more around being a good human than being a good gender mm. representer i love that what about you scott <laughs> you already know <laughs> <laughs> there's there's not a fear to anything we'll up go try whatever um so it's one of those things that within our circle that we have i've been nominated as the yes man <laughs> so ah. it's go and try um see what it is and honestly there's nothing really of no <laughs> it's just go try <laughs> just try anything once yes well and i also think that like scott thrives on kind of that well, hey, no one else is going to do it. I'll do it, you know, um, and it's fun to watch. It also turns around and we kind of have like this secret challenge between the two of us where if one of us kind of says, hey, you should do that. It's like you can't really back down. So, you know, like uh, there is this there's this marketing tool that basically uh, a lot of companies were using on on Twitter to kind of insight almost like a little bit of a battle, right? So they would kind of maybe diss the other company and it, you know, a lot of it basically would generate a lot of banter. And so I remember Scott was like, Hey, you should totally do this with, uh, you know, some of your referral partners. Again, no other people didn't realize kind of what we were doing and stuff like that. And it it didn't hurt uh, anybody, but you know, it was kind of one of those things where it's like, I probably would not have tried or put that out there before, you know? And so I think Scott really liked the idea that like, if you set a challenge that he's not going to back down. (laughs) So I think, I think for me, something that, and again, uh, a big contributor to this was Scott really in the catalyst coaching for me is to be unapologetic and to be authentic in sharing my story more. I would kind of share it in spurts in certain places in certain areas, just because I felt like that telling the story, I wasn't really great at it, but Scott was like, nobody else tells your own story better than you. And then I saw a meme shortly after that, that basically says, share your story because you won't like the other version that people tell. And so I started to really kind of embrace that. And traditionally, every time that I've kind of like done any sort of a performance or speaking, I always had show notes, right? I always had kind of had my poems directly on me. And Scott's like, why are you writing it down? He's like, just speak from the heart, speak your truth. And now I've kind of like abandoned being able to think about that and just kind of show up on stage or show up to the events to just speak from whatever is speaking to me in that moment and realizing that it, it's funny. Cause again, I told you, I, I felt like that. I didn't tell the story well. And for people to come up and be like, you're a great storyteller. You should join our program because we would actually benefit and other people would benefit from hearing you and the way that you tell us. And I'm like, see, I, I blocked myself this whole time and so uh now i'm just uh kind of like you unapologetically myself in being authentic and sharing my story i love that because that's ownership at work right there yes just basically owning that part of your life and that experience is um yeah people notice people feel it yes Mm -hmm. people want it yeah (laughs) yes definitely Carlo, we just want to give the last couple of minutes to you to really completely dialogue about anything that um, you would like to promote, anything you would like to highlight, or anything that you want to go ahead and talk about, or if there's any advice that you would want to go ahead and just give, um, again, either to our audience or to uh, other coaches. I mean, completely up to you. I want to offer gratitude again uh, because it's it's important, and I'm genuinely excited to to be in in this conversation um, and to be considered interesting enough to to be invited. So thank you. Absolutely. 
Uh, the second thing is, yeah, uh, for those of you who are listening and you're you're looking for a community or another community that you can contribute contribute to and and leverage a little bit more of the interpersonal connections that you have within your network or this this new network you're joining. Coaches promoting coaches is a really good space because it is a grassroots effort. Joining now means you get to create the experience with me uh, because I, I am learning as I go with with the people who participate in understanding what the needs are. So uh, you get to play that part. And it also shifts our culture uh, within the coaching community to be more open to helping each other and, and really understanding what each other does uh, and seeing that there's opportunity everywhere just because I I have a, for example, like a content and messaging coach in my group doesn't mean that she's just direct competition and she's going to take people away from me. Uh, the reframe there is, wow, there's somebody else who does what I do. I have somebody I can send people that are not a good match for me to work with. And when she or he doesn't have, uh, has leads that she doesn't, are, she's not excited to work with, but I know exactly how to work with, she can send them to me. I think we have an opportunity right now to build that culture and in resistance or in response to the marketing culture that's happening in the coaching world, which I feel like is going to hurt us eventually, especially in a very unregulated environment. So thank you for giving me this platform to talk about it because it's, it really isn't just like a social uh, or an opportunity to be social. It really is taking a stance and saying, as members of this collective community of coaches, we have a responsibility to our own experience and we can manage that experience better by working together. Couldn't have said it better myself, honestly. Thank you so much, Carlo. Uh, we just thankful and grateful for the opportunity to be able to spend more time with you and connect with you on this uh, uh, intimate platform here. Scott, any closing thoughts from you before we say goodbye to our Legacy Ninjas for today? The biggest thing that resounds for myself while I listen to Carlo speak is really that ownership piece for the Legacy Ninjas that have been listening and are at this point, write down and find out what that ownership piece is for you. What is that for you that you need to take ownership of? and really come forward with and run with it. So I would say that for me, the biggest takeaway was the ownership piece that Carlo really hit on within the uh, conversation. Absolutely. I love that. And I'm going to actually challenge our legacy ninjas to go ahead and actually share with us some of those things, some of their takeaways, right? So again, you guys can reach us out to us on Facebook, on Instagram under two native sons, and also on the website, it's the word two T W O native sons.com where you can go ahead and leave us a message with all of your information as well. May I add to what Scott said? I just got an Please. inspiration about the, the lazier side of ninja. <laughs> if laziness is part of your journey, think about how you can own that. There's no reason we all go through lazy patches and we can call it lazy. We can call it whatever word works for you. Just find a way to own it and figure out how you can actually work that to your advantage. The laziest people I met in my twenties are making millions because they've leveraged their laziness to say, I'm going to hire people. I'm going to make money so I can hire people. That was actually their motivation because they were too lazy to do their own work. And so there is always an opportunity for you to make your situation better if you just choose to own it, not deny it. Let it be in the car with you, whether it's worth self-worthiness, your imposter syndrome, or laziness. Let it ride in the car with you. Let it sit in the back seat, buckled down. Make sure you're still the driver every single time. So that's what I have to offer. Oh man, that's awesome. So many nuggets today, Carlo. Thank you so much. Uh, we're very oh. thankful, grateful for your time. Guys, if you are not already a part of that community, please join us, Coaches Promoting Coaches on Facebook. We'll catch you guys next time. Thank you so much for listening to another episode of Legacy Digging with Two Native Sons. Thank you, gentlemen. This was fun.